means for us and how specifically today God came in human flesh. That's the incarnation. That's verse 14. The word became flesh. Incarnation. We use that word theologically. We sometimes use it even in human terms that someone incarnates something. It represents something, a characteristic or a quality. Sometimes we even use it of of children of their parents, right? Like you see in the child the parent become more and more aware of this in my own maturation. As I get older, I can see more and more of my dad coming through me. There's certain character traits that we will display, even of our parents. We see it in children. Some look in physical appearance like them. Some act like them. And there's no doubt influence does that. Genetics does that. But in the incarnation, Jesus perfectly revealed the Father to us. The incarnation exhibits God and shows us the Father. Oh, this app's doing it again. I'm going to try to read this stretch of an app right here that I have open in my phone, but it constantly wants to reset itself when I restart it. So as it's doing this, let me just give you the background to this. This is a quotation from Michael Bird. He's written, he's a theologian that teaches in Australia, and he's written a, a a theology book entitled Evangelical Theology. And in his stretch of text on revelation, the revelation of God, when we speak theologically of revelation, we're talking about natural revelation. God can be seen in the creation. But we also have another form of revelation called special revelation, in which God reveals himself. And we typically think of special revelation as the Bible. God revealed scripture to us. He gave us scripture. And so we know about and see God in Scripture. But the greatest form of special revelation isn't nature, it isn't even the Bible, it's Jesus Christ. And here's what he says about that. Usually the incarnation is regarded as a subspecies of special revelation. However, I contend that the incarnation is qualitatively above and beyond all forms of special revelation by virtue of the immediacy, clarity, and personality of its revelation. When the fourth evangelist, speaking of John the Gospel writer, our passage today, wanted to describe the single greatest act of God's self-revelation, he did not say the Word became a book. Instead, he wrote the Word became flesh. Incarnation is the most efficacious revelation that God has ever made. The incarnation is not mediated through nature. It is not a word spoken through human agents. It's not given in the pages of a scroll. And it is not a word activated in the human mind. The incarnation is God in the flesh. It is the, he uses this word, perspicuous or clear clear and powerful revelation of God as a human being. Not God in human words, but God with a human face. Even, even though Scripture sometimes gets described in terms analogous to an incarnation as a God-man book, the Bible is not an incarnation of God's Word. The incarnation is in a class of its own as a type of revelatory act. It's unique. And this is why Bird concludes this way. That is why I call the incarnation extra, extra special revelation. It's the greatest revelation that's ever been given. It's extra, extra special. Nothing compares to those words that John writes in 1.14. And the Word who was in the beginning, who was with God, and who was God, the Word became flesh. That's the incarnation. We've seen this word occur already in verse 1. We've described it over the past two Sundays as God's revelatory, God's creative, and God's delivering self-expression. It's God making himself known to his creation, primarily to show them that they need to be made right with him through his saving work. 
Jesus is this revelatory, creating and saving word that makes life with God possible. And we will tease that out further in our sermon today. But we've highlighted already a few times in this series, and if you haven't been here with us throughout it, let me just catch you up. But this, this series is really looking at verses 1 to 18 so far in this opening of John's gospel. As he introduces the ministry of Christ, he places Christ's ministry, not with his birth, he doesn't begin it there, he begins it all the way back at the beginning of time with the Word, the eternal Word, the eternal second member of the Trinity who's always existed. And he's structured this prologue with a couple of unique verbs of being, we have the, the, when we use a verb of being in English, it's the word I am, or I was, or I did, or I, something like that. Verbs of being, I am, I was, I existed. Well, Greek has two of those. One is the, the verb, a me, I am, and that's the verb that occurs in 1-1. One, one. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. It's speaking of a being that didn't come into existence. It's something that always has been. He bees. He is. That's the word. But at the same time, there's another verb that comes into play here. And it's not just this, this verb that's always been being. There's another word that speaks of came into being or came into existence. And that's the verb that occurs in verse 3. The, ver, the, the, word by, uh, the word brings creation into existence. Through the word, through him, all things came into being. Without him, nothing came into being that came into being. There's that word occurring again and again. Verse 6 has it again for us. There was a man sent from God. There came into being a man sent from God. Speaking of the fact that John the Baptist, God made him and brought him and sent him to announce the way for Christ. We see it again in verse 10. The word was in the world, and though the world came into being through him, the world did not recognize him. There's a special use of it in verse 12. Yet to those who did receive him, this was our passage last week, those who accept him, believe in his name, he gives them the right to be, to come into existence as what? The children of God. You weren't a child of God before, but now that the word has come and God draws you through his spirit and you respond by receiving the word, you become, God makes you into the children of God. That verb of coming into existence is the one that occurs in verse 14. The word became, came into existence as flesh. Now that does not mean that the that the second member of the Trinity got created. No, verse 1 specifically indicates the Word always was because the Word is God. But His humanity, His physicality comes into being at the Incarnation. And this is what we want to tease out in our passage today. The Word becoming flesh we are to see something unique in this creative act of God in incarnation. It's teased out in verses 14 through 18 by that same verb for coming into existence, coming into being, used again and again in this stretch of text. And so we'll structure the sermon around this in reference to incarnation. First of all, in his incarnation, the word became human. That's the phrase at the beginning of verse 14. The Word became flesh. God's self-expression, the Word, who was both God and was with God, became flesh. This is so fascinating. He becomes, it's the idea is God enters into His creation and through the second member of the Trinity becomes part of the physical creation. That which came into being by the powerful word of the second member of the Trinity, the second member of the Trinity now becomes as he becomes flesh. The creator enters into creation. What does it mean to be flesh? What does it mean to be human? 
What is that that he became? What makes you unique in all of the creation? How do we stand out about, above other creatures? Well, part of it is our intellect, right? We can think, we can choose, we can act, we can will. Further, beyond just animalistic things and, and instinct, we have purpose and creativity to us. We invent things, we do things out of our intellect, out of our ambition, out of our will. All of that is essential to what it means to be human. It actually mirrors God, right, in a lot of ways. He created us in his image, and God is all of these things. But part of being human goes beyond just that. We get to experience pleasure. There's things that make us happy, that give us joy, that we get excited about. There's things in this life that make us sorrowful. Part of being human is that we grieve. We experience frustration. We get upset. Part of what it means to be human is that we are birthed, that there's maturation, there's growth, there's dependence on parents. And even as we grow and mature into adulthood, we still experience weakness. There's frailty to us as humans. As we grow older or sick, eventually we face the prospect, prospect of what? Death. And all of us that are humans live under the curse of sin and death. All of that is part of what it means to be human. When God became flesh, when the Word became flesh, He entered into that. The Creator became human, and lived all of this out. And I think that's why John uses the term flesh rather than just man. Because flesh has physicality, it has weakness, it has frailty, it has all of that tied up into it. And John wants us to communicate that when the Word became flesh, He entered into all of that. Jesus would go through maturation and birth and growing up. Jesus would die and experience death. He would have to mature like we do. Luke tells us that, right? He grew in knowledge, wisdom, stature before God. I don't know what that all means other than that Jesus matured just like humans mature. He wanted, John did in this conveying Jesus becoming flesh, to show us that he experienced all of that weakness and all of that frailty that we experience. He never ceased being God, the Word, but now God has taken on flesh. He is now the God-man. As man, he now has entered into the realm of physical creation. And that's interesting that he's entered into the realm of physical creation because what do we know about the creation in relationship to God? The creation is at enmity with God. It stands opposed to God. And by becoming flesh, Jesus now enters into the context where this world stands opposed to God. He lives and dwells there. Jesus himself isn't opposed to God, but he is now light living in the darkness. He is now the creator taking on flesh. He doesn't take on the spiritual condition of the flesh, but he lives in the context that stands opposed to God in order to redeem this creation. God, the Word, became human. Two facets that accompany this. John teases them out in verse 14. He made his dwelling among us. God dwelled with us. The Creator dwelled with the creation. God became a human ultimately to reveal Himself to us. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 2. In the past, God spoke through prophets, but now He has spoken through Son, the Son, the Word. But this idea of dwelt also comes along with Old Testament baggage. When did God dwell or how did God dwell with his people in the Old Testament? He did it through the what? 
the temple. Prior to the temple, he did it primarily through the tabernacle. And that word, and especially that speaks of God dwelling in his tabernacle, is that Greek word translated, translating the Old Testament Hebrew word is this word that occurs here in John 1.14. He dwelled. Just like God dwelt in the Old Testament with his people, he took up residence among us. He pitched his tent in our lives. He took up residence with us. These last months, Tia and I have experienced uh, that, that phase of empty nesting. We've come to enjoy it in a lot of ways. We've been able to declutter and get rid of things and, and open the house back up. But now we're at that break where the families all come back home and the girls are back home and living and dwelling with us again. And there's lots of fun with that, but there's also lots of clutter with that as well as the girls throw their suitcases down and then let clothes fly all over the room. But there's things that we expect and, un- and anticipate when they come back. We expect Hallie to play guitar. We expect Emily to want to drive and take over the car and do all of those sorts of things. And that happens. There's things that we anticipated and expected and have occurred again. When Jesus dwelt with us, he took up residence here on this earth It wasn't something that was expected. It wasn't something that could completely anticipate. In fact, God with us was something completely unique in the person, the God-man, Jesus Christ. And when he came, people anticipated what he should be like and completely missed him. The word became flesh, became human. God dwelled with us. But secondly, this word manifest God's glory and character. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, the unique Son, begotten, and we'll talk about that word as we get to verse 18, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word translated dwelled, yes, speaks of the idea of pitching his tent, but it also came to represent this idea of the glory of God taking up residence in the midst of his people. Remember when, when the tabernacle was first built, and the people erected it in Exodus chapter 40, and it gets completed. What did God's presence do? It, that pillar of fire, that cloud, came and physically took up residence in that tent. The people could see the glory of God in the fire and in the cloud above this tabernacle. When Solomon completed God's temple in 1 Kings 8, God's glory filled the temple. And John is saying here, when we, the first disciples, walked alongside Jesus, we beheld what? The glory of God. The glory of the Word. We experienced the manifest glory of God in this person. This glory that is full of grace and truth. These words that describe the very nature, the character of God. When Moses saw the glory of God in Exodus chapter 33 and 34, remember he couldn't see the full picture of God, but God passed by Moses when he gave the law, and he he hid himself, hid Moses in the rock, and his glory passed in front of him, and Moses heard the name of God expressed. The gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, this one is God. Jesus, or John is saying of, of the word Jesus here that we beheld the glory of God, this glory that characterizes grace and truth, the goodness of God. We experienced it in the word. This was the hope of the Old Testament that the glory of God not only would dwell amongst the people of God, but in Isaiah's vision of ultimate reality, new heavens, new earth, the hope for all of this world, all of this creation, Isaiah 66 verse 18, is that God would display his glory so that the nations, all peoples, would see his glory. And this is exactly what came with the word. We beheld his glory. 
but a glory not just for eyewitnesses, a glory for this entire world to see, and yet it isn't a glory that they anticipated. This glory would be displayed in a very unexpected way. John 12 speaks of it in verse 32. When it says, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, Jesus speaking here, when I am exalted, when I am lifted up in my moment of greatest glory in my human flesh, I will draw all people to myself. All will be drawn by the exaltation of Jesus. But this isn't his ascension. This isn't judgment day when every knee will bow. Verse 33 says he said this to show the kind of death that he was going to die. The glory of God displayed in the word put to death on a cross. That's the grace of God that we all need. God's glory became flesh for that reason so that the word could die in our place. So that he could bring many sons and daughters to glory. I'll tease the implications of that out in the conclusion. But there's a second aspect to the incarnation that I want to see out of John's presentation here. The word became flesh. But verse 15, the second use of this came word, coming into being word, is found in verse 15. The coming one came as the greatest one. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, this is the one I spoke of when I said, he who comes after me, and the word here is translated in the NIV, this word for came, surpassed me because he was before me. The ministry of John the Baptist we've already highlighted from verses 6 through 8. John, like many Old Testament prophets, came to to fulfill a very specific mission from God to announce God's word, to announce God's revelation. But John stands at the pinnacle, the climax of all Old Testament prophets because he's going to usher in the way, Jesus Christ. He's going to usher in his ministry. John's not the light, but he's a witness to it. And he witnesses to the all-surpassing person and work of the word. And it cries out this important message. This is the one I was speaking of. Here's the content of the message. The one coming after me. Let me translate it very wooden literally here. The one coming after me comes before me because he was before me. Both verbs of being there. Comes before me because he was before me. John is making a very important point. And it's actually kind of an oxymoron here. There's going to be one who comes after me, but he is before me because he was before me. Meaning the one I am announcing, yes, he will come after. But he's greater than me. He's well before me because he existed before me. As God. The culmination of Old Testament prophecy lived out by the Baptist cannot compare to the greatness of the Word God incarnate. The prophets, the prophecies, I would suggest the entirety of the Old Testament finds its fulfillment and finds its end in the Word Jesus Christ. The God man. The word becoming human and dwelling among us. This would be the greatest human ever. Choosing to come and pitch his tent among us. I was trying to think about what that would even look like today. Who's the greatest human on earth today? I mean, that would be up for discussion, right? I mean, are we going to take a celebrity? Are we going to take a sports star? I... They're not, I just don't think they're impactful enough. Just think if, if somebody like Warren Buffett, right, the great investor, billion, billion, billionaire, right, came to you and said, I want to build a little residence in your backyard, and I want to dwell in your backyard for the next three years, and I want to spend time with you and teach you how to take your finances and invest them properly 
and create real wealth. Or, or, or take Elon Musk and he, say, I'm going to build a little shack in your backyard and I'm going to dwell there for three years and show you how to creatively come up with plans and ideas and put them into motion and create business and be successful and accomplish all sorts of things. I mean, we would be foolish not to let them neighbor in our backyard, right, and, and show us all of this stuff. But this is one who far surpasses any human that's ever existed. This is the greatest human who's ever existed, saying that I want to dwell with you. I want to be in residence with you and show you the way into right relationship with God and teach you the way to walk after me so that you can be eternally secure and live eternally beyond death and live fully and completely in new heavens and new earth one day. This is the God-man, the greatest person to ever live, dwelling among us, but it's beyond dwelling among us. If we believe and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, he dwells where? In us through his Spirit. He takes up residence in us as the church of Jesus Christ today. The greatest one has come to us. And lastly, from the incarnation in Jesus coming, I want us to see in his incarnation, Jesus came as grace and truth for all. Out of his fullness, out of the fullness of grace and truth, all of the character of what it means to be God, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Because the word is God, because the word became human, he, as the greatest human, embodied the fullness of God. He was full God, full deity. The fullness of God dwelt in him, Colossians 2, verse 9. All that it means that God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love to those who are his, Jesus embodied so that when you saw and experienced Jesus, you saw and experienced the grace and the compassion and the love of God. Jesus says this to his disciples in John 14. To Thomas's question about, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus will say to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And if you really know me, then you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. You've seen the Father, Jesus is saying. And Philip asks, well, how is that? Show us the Father and that will be enough, Jesus and Jesus answers, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Jesus was the perfect reflection of the Father. The Word became flesh. And as we beheld his glory, we saw and received the fullness of grace. And since he displayed and brought the fullness of God, his followers get to participate and receive the fullness of God's grace in Christ Jesus. You have received something amazing and incredible because you have Christ in you. You have grace in place of grace already given. We stand in such a privileged position. Well, how does grace replace grace? That's what verse 17 explains. There's a contrast there. Some translations translate this grace upon grace or grace heaped up on more grace, and that's true. But the preposition actually really conveys throughout the New Testament this idea of in place of or instead of. 
You have grace instead of grace. You have greater grace. Before Jesus, grace existed, but it was a mediated grace. Before he came, people could experience the grace of God, but it was a grace that God gave to his people in the law through Moses. It was mediated. You were given it. We tend not to think of the law as grace. We read Scripture kind of anachronistically from our perspective today. We look back and look at all of it through Jesus Christ, and so the law is kind of like an enemy of Jesus, or the law is the enemy of faith in Paul's theology. But the law to the Jew of the first century, especially coming out of an Old Testament perspective, was the revelation of God. It was what God gave to his people so that they could know God, so they could experience God. They could receive his forgiveness and know how to live their lives in relationship to him. The law was given by God to Moses at Sinai, and it showed the people how God could dwell in their midst at that time. So it was mediated grace through the law as God's presence was mediated God's presence was there in and among his people, but it was in a temple, it was in a tabernacle, it was behind a veil in the Holy of Holies. The people could not experience the full measure, the completeness of God's presence. It was veiled from his people. And as someone in that era who would have received God's grace in this way, you would have received grace through law that God gave to Moses. This was God's chosen mechanism at that time to demonstrate grace to his people. It was grace, but it was mediated. In contrast to this, this is the point. Now we get unmediated grace. This is why we have grace instead of grace. We get a much greater grace. Notice the contrast in verse 17. The law was given through Moses but here's our word came again or came into existence. Grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. Unmediated grace. Full expression, unveiled, no longer through law and other agents, but to us through Jesus Christ. The grace that comes with the incarnation replaces any grace that came from law. It supersedes all grace that preceded it. And we get to experience and see the fullness of his grace, the fullness of his truth, because we have received grace and truth through Jesus Christ. This is the first time, if you've paid attention through this series, this is the first time John mentions Jesus Christ. He's referred to him as the word, but all of the pronouns, this one, and those things that refer are always referring to the Word, the second member of the Trinity. But now the Word has incarnated, has become flesh. The greatest one has arrived, and he has brought unmediated access to grace, and that is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. God made flesh. All that Moses heard when Yahweh passed in front of him now comes into being in the person and work of Jesus. And Ed Klink in his commentary on this stretch of text points out this fact. This will be the last occurrence of the word grace in the Gospel of John, 118. You won't see the word occur again, I mean 116 and 17. It doesn't occur again because grace has no meaning for John other than Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus embodies grace. There's no need to speak of grace anymore. It's Jesus. We still fully experience this. Yes, Jesus has ascended, but he has sent another, one that is even greater, will have more greater effect, and that is his what? His spirit. And it indwells you and it indwells me and it indwells this church. So that we have the very unmediated grace of God living in us. 
because we are believers in Jesus Christ. It's the main idea of our passage this morning. Jesus came. He became flesh. He came as the greatest one. Grace and truth came through him to reveal and explain the unseen God to us. No one has ever seen God, verse 18. But the one and only Son, the monogamous God, who is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. The Old Testament makes very clear that no one could ever look on God and live. Well, I thought Moses saw him. He saw his backside. He saw partial. But the full glory of God shown to any human would immediately consume us. This is why we need Jesus, the one who is in the most intimate relationship with the Father in his bosom, he is the one who reveals and explains and makes known to us the Father. Jesus is the ultimate disclosure of God himself because he is the one and only, the unique one. That word occurs in verse 14. It occurs again in verse 18. The glory of the one and only Son. This is such a difficult word to translate into English because it's loaded up with all kinds of meaning. It's the, ver- it's the word that occurs in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his monogenes, his one and only, his unique Son. It's that same word. It's actually... The Ganes word is our word, ginomai, that word of being or coming into existence that's dominated this stretch of text. It's the noun form of it. Attached to an adverb, an only, and you get this adjective or it's actually a, a substantive. It's a noun. This one and only unique son, God. It's describing the word. It's describing the son. It's describing Jesus. That's uniquely existing in this relationship to the Father. And it, it's important that we see the contrast that's being made. In verses 12 through 13, we are called, those of us who believe in Jesus, who receive him, we are called what? The children of God, children born. Not of flesh or human desire or husband's will, but born of God. So that we are born, we are created by God as children of God. We come into existence, he births us. So we are God's children. And in a sense, we are then siblings with Jesus as the son of God. But he doesn't call Jesus the born one from God. He calls him this word to distinguish Jesus from us. Yes, we're Siblings of Jesus, because he is the Son of God and we are born of God. But he is unique and different and only in a way that we aren't, because he is eternally God himself. That's why John uses this word. He has eternally been God's child, existing in perfect fellowship with him. You know, if we want to find out something about the parent, the father, or the mother, who do we go to? Whom do we go to? You know, I've done some funerals recently, and uh, and funerals that we participate in, there's a eulogy that's typically given. Who eulogizes the person? Sometimes it's a friend, occasionally a spouse, but most regularly, uh, it's the child, The child provides the eulogy. Why? Because the child knows the parent. The child grew up under the care of the parent. All of us that are human have this tendency to put a veneer on, a a wall up when we go out into public, right? We want people to see the best of us. But once you get in your house and you're dwelling with the children, they see the real you. Because the guard comes down. 
The child is the one who's got the experiences with the parent, and they can tell us things about the parent that we never knew. When God wanted to reveal himself to us, he sent his son to declare and to make him known, to tell us about the father, to reveal the father, to make him known. Only he can truly make the father known to us. Because as the father is light, he is light. As the father is life, Jesus is life. And as God is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness to us, so is Jesus Christ. He's the embodiment of that. There's no longer a need to go through priests, sacred sites, rituals to approach God. Jesus gives us direct access to God continually. He makes him known And if he has made himself known to us and we have received him, now we are his spiritual sibling and we are the children of God. Which means we have direct access to our Heavenly Father. All of this is accomplished by the incarnation. One of my favorite, I I will say it's my favorite hymn. It's right up, it as well is one of my favorite hymns too, but... And Can It Be by Charles Wesley. We sang one of his hymns this morning, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, all that theology that's loaded. That's Wesley. He wrote incredibly theologically loaded hymns, over 6,500 of them in his lifetime. That is a ton of hymns that he wrote. One of his first hymns that he ever composed was And Can It Be, describing his conversion experience and that chorus that resonates amazing love How can it be that my God should die for me, right? But the fifth stanza, the last stanza of that song says this, No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. So bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. We have access to God because he dwelt in Jesus Christ. He took up his residence here among us so that we could know and experience and dwell with God eternally. And we, don't, we won't do that someday when we go to heaven. We get to do it right now, people, because Christ is in us. So that's the question that we come out of this sermon today. Jesus came to reveal and explain God Are we seeing and understanding and knowing God through Jesus Christ? All of what Jesus Christ represented, all of who he is, can be understood and known and lived out by us as revealed in his word. What's the challenge for us today? What what can we go away with? This was something I was thinking about as I was trying to apply this to my life. When I wake up in the morning, what, like, what is the first thing I do? Well, after you reach over and hit the off on the alarm, right? Past the snooze buttons. Get, get to the one where you actually turn it off and start getting up. Some of you are slower risers than the rest of us, right? I have one daughter and a wife who are not morning people. Then my other daughter and me, we're the morning people. Some of us get up, right up and get after it. Others of us, it takes a little slower. But however you approach into that getting up process... Rather than entering and doing anything else, take 30 seconds, take a minute and pray. Try to do that every day this week and praise God for some facet of Jesus Christ and how God has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ and how he has blessed us with his grace and start your morning thanking him for that, but then also praying that God would reflect that in your life this week as you go about not only your week but your day because here's the truth Jesus came not simply to save you but Jesus came to bear witness of himself to explain the father through you to others to mirror himself in us both corporately and as individuals so start your day praying God 
Reflect Christ through me. Show and demonstrate that Jesus dwells in me this week, this day, in my actions, in my attitudes, in my responses. May people see your grace in me. May they experience your love in me. May they not see frustration, but may they receive forgiveness from me. We say that our convictions as a church, Clearwater community, are that we exist for the glory of God. Is the glory of God seen in us? If we've experienced God's dwelling, His incarnating in Jesus, and we've trusted that, then we are the children of God, the siblings of Jesus, the ones, the conduits through which Jesus will show Himself today. We exist to display that glory And that glory is manifest, it's seen, it's displayed in Jesus Christ as we proclaim and believe and live out and obey that gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that God became flesh. That the greatest one has come and that he came to bring us grace and truth to reveal the Father. And as we live that, as we believe that, as we seek to proclaim and obey that truth, Christ transforms us to look like himself so that people see Jesus in us. Do you believe that? And do people see Christ dwelling in you? Lord, as we close this morning, may that be a prayer and a question that confronts us each day this week, Lord, as we rise in the morning. How will people see Christ dwelling in me today? How will people see that I am a recipient of your grace? I am a recipient of your truth. Not to serve self, not to do what I want to do, but as a display, a mechanism, a conduit, an instrument to be used to point people to Jesus Christ. God, may we praise you and thank you as we do right now, each day this week, that you became flesh to dwell among us, to show us your glory. Lord, may we be those that testify and witness that the greatest one who's ever lived has come to us so that we can receive the grace, the truth, the fullness of God and that that might now be lived out in our relationship to this world, to one another, within our families so that others might experience God in us. Emmanuel has come the miracle of incarnation. Lord, may we display it in our actions and in our words and our thoughts and in our prayers this week for your glory to display Christ. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Would you all stand with us as we close our service and the invitation is to indeed behold the mystery that is the incarnation, that is the the gospel, the life that we have because of Jesus.